I am playing these fantasy role-playing games and war games back in its beginnings during the 1970s and into the very early 1980s. This is before the dawn of all the new video technology available through the internet and on computers in today's world. This is before the age of all the very violent video games that are so readily accessible today with all kinds of ratings for the level of death and bloodshed the game can produce. Today's video games make us old timers look like stone age amateurs. There is a similarity though. Both our old school wargaming and Dungeons and Dragons playing and the modern violent video games of today waste tons of time and steer its players into a non-Christian mindset that is completely alien to the biblical commands for the Christian lifestyle. This is the satanic strategy that has captured the hearts and minds of so many today and in the end leads to destruction in the lake of fire when God demands each person to give account for how he spent his life. Revelation chapter 20. Flee these things while you can. One last note before we present this special interview to immediately follow here. The video that was actually produced by Steve Metz and crew had very little of what I said in it. So viewers will now be able to get the rest of the story, so to speak. I'm Larry Wessels. I'm director of Christian Answers. And I used to be a dungeon master for a couple of years back in the early 80s and late 1970s. And I played the game for years before that. Okay. My name is David Krill, and I'm a member of the In Defense of the Faith team. Uh, we're an apologetic ministry. We've been doing it for about 12 years. We answer questions about the Bible, uh, misconceptions of Christianity. Uh, we defend the true gospel that's laid out in Scripture. Uh, and we do live programs on ACTV where we take live calls from the Austin area. Okay. Um, all right, you guys are already, looks like you're kind of prepared to talk. Yeah. All right, this uh, Dungeons and Dragons game is a game that came about in the uh, early to mid 1970s by a, its creator, Gary Gygax, who uh, started his own company publishing these books such as are before me here on the table. Uh, he basically got his inspiration from uh, the Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, uh, his trilogy. And when you, and, and for me, for instance, I got involved in this when I was still in high school back in the 70s. And I continued to be involved in it all through my college years at the University of Texas. And uh, even beyond it, after I graduated in 1981. Uh, and uh, what you find in Dungeons and Dragons and Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, there's several level, levels or tiers to this game uh, is that if you're familiar at all with the Lord of the Rings, suddenly this game comes to life to you because the creatures, the, the characters, everything seems to be lifted from that trilogy by Tolkien. Uh, you've got orcs, magic users, otherwise known as wizards, uh, sort of like Gandalf in the, in, in the movie and in the books and things. You've got elves, dwarves, all kinds of monsters. Uh, and what Gary uh, Gygax did is he, he made this game come to life from the books, The Lord of the Ring, to where players could play out Tolkien's trilogy, with, but only creating new chapters in the book, you might say. And what you need basically to play this game is just a good imagination and a dungeon master who's got even a better imagination. <laughs> and the dungeon master is the one who really makes this game come to life. And it's a game that's done without any boards. Uh, you, don't, you don't need uh, the usual uh, accessories that you would think you would need for a normal game, like say if you're playing Monopoly. Monopoly, you know, you need the board and you need dice and things. Now, of course, Dungeons and Dragons uses dice, as we'll talk about this, but Really, the key to it all is not so much a board or uh, uh, having the accessories and things like that. The key to it is your imagination and how far can your imagination take you. And that's the intrigue of this game. 
Dungeons and Dragons. And so back in the 70s, uh, I got involved in it, still in high school, with some people that were already familiar with it. Uh, the game wasn't that well known back then, it was just kind of starting out. And in the late, or mid to late 70s, uh, the, the game Dungeons and Dragons was taking in somewhere around $150,000 a year in sales through various hobby shops. You know, there's these little stores that sell like chess sets and, and, and games like that. Well, that's where you'd find the game. You couldn't go to like a, like a Target or a Sears or something like that and find it at a big department store, but little hobby shops that dealt in certain things, you could find it there. Well, suddenly in 1979, there was a, a national media interest news case about a Dal Dallas Egbert III who suddenly turned up missing. And so it, it just became a big media event. What happened to this guy? Uh, what was he doing? And you start to find out all the little things about this guy's interests. And one of his interests was he liked to play Dungeons and Dragons. And this suddenly gave uh, all kinds of free advertising to Gary Gygax and his or organization that sold these Dungeons and Dragons games. And he goes in the late 1970s from $150,000 a year in sales through these little game shops and things to $150 million a year, where now suddenly everybody's picking up on these games from a, a few thousand players in the mid-70s, of which I was one of them. Uh, and I still remember playing many games back home in Houston, where I came from in high school, and then in college in the dorms. We'd be playing at the University of Texas campus in the different dormitories with a group of guys, and there'd be a dungeon master there with his dungeon master's manual, and he would set the stage, and then we would play out with our little characters. But uh, suddenly, you went after that media event with this Dallas Egbert III, you, you end up with millions of people playing it. Up to three million was the uh, figure by, I believe it was 1981. So with that national news media, uh, it turned out to help them beyond all scope to where this game just came on the global scene, you might say. And uh, from there, it, is, it has grown to where you have all these offshoot uh, 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 games that have come out. Here's just one example here. Uh, this one's called uh, Magic the Gathering. There's been like Wizard Quest and uh, all kinds of offshoots of D Dungeons and Dragons that are in a similar vein. You've got the movie Star Wars came out and Star Wars uh, there was uh, a sci-fi uh, game that was much like Dungeons and Dragons, except it keyed on characters you would find in Star Wars, and it was called like Traveler. And we used to play that a lot too. So uh, just like Dungeons and Dragons takes characters and monsters and things out of the Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings, you would have other uh, fantasy role-playing games uh, known as, you know, Fantasy F Roll R playing games, P, it would be referred to in the short, FRP games, fantasy role-playing games, coming out along other lines, Star Wars or whatever, uh, Lord of the Rings, whatever, and uh, it suddenly became just big business. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. To see the full length video, please select by tapping on the first screen to the right. To see the entire playlist where this particular video is found, select by tapping on a touch screen on a cell phone or by clicking on a regular computer, the second screen to the right.